So with all the kind words out of the way, uh, let's talk about the real science here. Um, I, I debated uh, in, in my mind in terms of uh, what to talk about uh, today. And, and I thought that last time I talked about HIV when I visited, this time I want to talk about the companion virus that we also work on, which is the human T cell leukemia virus uh, in, in the laboratory. And part of the reason I want to talk about HTLV-1 is because in 2010, it's really a landmark year for HTLV-1 because it marks exactly the 30th anniversary of the discovery of HTLV-1 by Bob Gallo, um, so exactly 30 years uh, ago. And in that period of time, we have participated uh, perhaps uh, 24 years or so in terms of uh, our uh, contributions to HTLV-1 research. And so today what I want to do is tell you three short stories about what we find uh, is interesting and, and perhaps is informative in terms of where the field stand uh, for the purposes of understanding how a human retrovirus infects CD4 positive T cells use a number of cell factors ultimately to cause disease uh, in the CD4 positive T cells. Now, when we talk about HTLV-1, um, basically what we're talking about is a disease called adult T cell leukemia. So this particular illness was originally discovered in Japan, and it is a very aggressive leukemia in the sense that if you were to come to me and tell me that you have been diagnosed with adult T cell leukemia, I would predict that your survival rate, uh, even despite heroic treatment, would probably be no more than six months, okay? So it is an intractable leukemia. By the time of diagnosis, it is usually bad news. The good news is that it is um, invariably depend upon HTLV-1 infection, but the penetration of the disease in infected individuals is less than 5%, and usually after a 20 to 30 year latency period, okay? So this suggests then that between the time of infection by the virus, okay, to the causation, the full transformation, the full-blown leukemia, okay, there must necessarily be a number of different events because otherwise one would not need 20 to 30 years to develop. The virus also causes an inflammatory disease called HTLV-associated myelopathy or tropical spastic paraparesis, and the virus causes a uh, quite uh, significant uh, autoimmune inflammatory and, and cytokine changes uh, in the infected individual. And I also want to hasten to add that although most of you probably have never heard of HTLV-1, the global prevalence of the virus is not that of an orphan disease. So for example, it is not 50 or 100 individuals or 500 individuals like progeria, for example, but it is indeed actually 10 to 20 million carriers of which we have a concentration of 1 to 2 million people in Japan where indeed this disease has a has a lot of visibility, a lot of focus, and, and a lot of work has been done there. Now, in terms of the presentation of the disease, um, frequently we would get uh, phone calls from uh, first line, uh, our dermatological colleagues, because the disease is really an infiltrating uh, dermatological uh, uh, presentation. Um, that frequently shows up with these type of skin lesions. And they are manifestations of transformed T leukemic cells that, that sort of uh, go into uh, the uh, dermis uh, uh, and, and the epidermis and, and create a sort of cutaneous and inflammatory changes. And so, so initially, um, the virus, uh, the disease was misdiagnosed as a cutaneous T cell uh, lymphoma, leukemia, but subsequently when the virus was isolated, it became clear that it was uh, a completely different class of disease that is independent of the uh, spontaneous uh, uh, T-cell cutaneous uh, leukemia lymphoma 
but it's a viral etiology and it's called uh, adult T cell leukemia. Now, at the cellular level, um, the presentation of, of the transformed cell is quite unique because there is no other leukemia that will ever look like ATL on a peripheral blood smear. So, so if you are a pathology student or if you're a medical student and this uh, question shows up on your pathology or your med medical board test, I can tell you that if you ever see a picture of a nucleus that looks like a flower, okay, you see it's, it's sort of these petals of the flower from the, from the middle of the spoke uh, coming out, it's actually quite beautiful, okay? Uh, but these flower-shaped nuclei, okay, are indeed absolutely pathognomonic for the diagnosis of adult T-cell leukemia. So any sort of self-respecting pathologist, if they see this type of blood smear, you don't really need any viral serology, you don't really need to see any PCR or isolation. This is really the hallmark of what ATL is. Now the other thing, in terms of a molecular biologist, what it tells us when we see this kind of gross distortion of the nuclear morphology is that there must be fairly significant alteration in terms of genetic damage in these cells. And indeed, that turns out to be the case. Okay. Now, from the point of view of understanding how a virus goes about infecting a cell and a normal CD4 positive T cell, and after some period of duration of integration and, and residence inside the cell, to ultimately cause a cell to become a malignant transformed leukemic cell, one has to try to understand what is the mechanism. Okay? So a number of different laboratories, including my laboratory, has spent a lot of work trying to understand what is really the transforming entity for HDLV1. And suffice it to say, that the, the uniform conclusion and the consensus is that, in fact, the entire transforming capacity of the virus can be encapsulated into the expression of this single oncoprotein called TAX. Okay? So essentially, if you don't have TAX, if you mutate that open reading frame in the virus, it becomes a non-transforming virus, okay? And if you simply express the tax oncoprotein in singularity, in the absence of all the other open reading frames, okay, you can, in good facsimile, recapitulate essentially all the transformation steps and phenomenon that one sees from a viral infection. So suggesting then, that if one were to try to understand how the virus goes about transforming a primary T cell into a leukemic cell, then one has to focus on understanding the mechanisms and the cellular factors that are impinged upon by the tax protein. Okay. So we were challenged with this question then, I would say about, so it took us about five to 10 years to characterize all the different factors and so on. Um, and, and to do all the mutagenesis and, 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 and so forth. And ultimately, about uh, 15 years ago, we decided then that it became incumbent upon us to try to understand how this oncoprotein, and whether it shares similar or divergent mechanisms with other oncoproteins in terms of cellular transformation. So now if you think if the question that you are opposed to, okay, is how you go about transforming a cell, okay, there are really a menu of various choices that you can take in terms of hypothesis testing for will my oncoprotein do this as an entree to transformation? Will my oncoprotein do that as a process to transformation? Okay, so, so really then, 15, about 10, 15 years ago, okay, we decided that one of the hypotheses that we were going to test okay, and try to embrace is the idea that perhaps the road to transformation goes through the genetic damage as encapsulated by the word aneuploidy. Okay? 
So, so I don't want to pretend to you that we have any sort of prophetic insight into that as being you know, the best mechanism for transformation. But what I do want to say to you is that when we sat down and considered all of the different numerologies, okay, all the different correlations, we walked away okay, with the sense that if you look at all cancers, okay, the best single sort of genotypic correlation with transformation is the development of any employee. Okay? So for example, everybody buys the fact that P53 mutations are correlated with cancer development. Okay? But I want to say to you that honestly, when you look carefully, okay, the correlation is only 50%. Only 50% of cancers have P53 changes. On the other hand, if you look at all series of cancers, okay, doesn't matter whether it's solid tumor, doesn't matter whether it's liquid tumor, doesn't matter whether it's lung cancer or whether it's breast cancer and so on and so forth. Okay? If you look at all cancers, okay, the correlation of aneuploidy with transformation is in large excess to P53, easily 70 to 80 percent correlation as opposed to 50 percent correlation. Now, of course, the field is hotly debated on whether the presentation of aneuploidy is a cause of transformation or is a consequence of transformation. But now, I think with earlier diagnosis and following dysplastic changes, okay, it becomes quite clear that actually dysplasia okay, starts in many cases as euploidy, and only when you have malignant transformation do you have the, 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 the follow-up of aneuploidy. And I will also show you in our experimental system, we can actually make a quite persuasive case that aneuploidy can be causal as opposed to consequential of transformation. And of course, one of the reasons why we stuck on aneuploidy was in fact that in ATL cells, P53 dysfunction okay, does occur, but P53 mutations are very rare, okay? whereas all ATL cells are aneuploid. Okay? So the correlation of ATL development with aneuploidy is in fact the best correlation of all classes of cancers. So suggesting to us then that it is probably, if we are going to make an educated guess on the pathway okay, that the tax oncoprotein might exert for transforming the cells, okay, a good guess would be tax does something to cause aneuploidy in the T cells and the, the presentation of aneuploidy in certain configurations then leads to the transformation of those cells to adult T leukemic uh, uh, phenotype. Okay, so we embarked on trying to understand how the oncoprotein would in fact cause aneuploidy. Okay, and so this is the first part of my story. So the first part of my story is to say that one of our observations, or one of the insights that we, we accrued, was that in fact in HTLV1 infected cell, the tax oncoprotein directly impinges and inactivates the spindle assembly checkpoint. Okay? And it turns out that the spindle assembly checkpoint is indeed one of the leading sentries to guard against the development of aneuploidy. Okay? So, so some of you may not understand okay, or may not have heard about the spindle assembly checkpoint. Okay? So I would say that everybody in this room, I would argue, knows about P53. Right? So P53 is a major guardian of the checkpoint between G1 to S. Okay? And it has been okay, quite uh, persuasively argued that this particular checkpoint is measuring or monitoring structural DNA damage. And that makes sense because in G1, if you have a structural DNA damage on one strand, okay, you want to halt that and repair that before you go to S because that structural damage would be copied into two copies of damage. Okay? So it makes sense that structural damages should be censored okay, and should be sensed at this stage okay, to prevent further ramifications when it's duplicated. Now, there turns out to be a later checkpoint that was discovered after the P53 checkpoint, which is a checkpoint at mitosis. Okay? So at this point, really there is no major benefit in, in trying to censor against structural damage because the horse has really left the barn in terms of copying and amplifying the structural damage. But what you need here okay, is in fact a checkpoint that knows how to count. Because the purpose of mitosis is really a equal division of duplicated chromosomes from the mother cell to the two daughter cells. 
So you want to make sure at this point that there is a counting mechanism that says 46 chromosomes have exited into daughter A cells and the other 46 chromosomes have exited into daughter B cells. So that one diploid cell, one euploid cell, ends up producing two progeny euploid daughter cells, right? So that is very important. And so, so evolution has evolved then a number checker, uh, checkpoint, okay, to guard against the development of aneuploidy. And all aneuploidy is is to say that instead of 46, you have some number other than 46. Could be 45, could be 23, could be 47. Any number other than 46, okay, is defined as an aneuploid genome. Okay, so the idea is that we want to prevent aneuploidy, okay, we want to make sure that aneuploidy is corrected, and if it's not corrected, the checkpoint will send that cell into apoptosis. So it never has a chance to develop into a tumor, okay. That is in theory what is happening, okay. So now this particular checkpoint has been characterized, well characterized forever in the day, okay. So as of uh, about um, 10, 12 years ago when we entered into the game of trying to understand, okay, how this particular century prevents the development of aneuploidy, prevents the manifestation of aneuploid cells of being able to be around, okay, the entire checkpoint and the components of this checkpoint at that time was unknown. So we were actually very fortunate, okay, in contributing to the understanding of the spindle, uh, spindle assembly checkpoint, which has a bunch of proteins that sit over here and a bunch of proteins that sit at the kinetochore to monitor the fidelity of these strings putting, pulling on these duplicate chromosomes to make sure that in fact the tension is exactly the same to the right hand side and to the left hand side so that there will be equal partitioning and equal separation of two euploid daughter cells, right? So it requires the understanding of proteins are here and the proteins are here that makes up the century of the spindle assembly checkpoint. And so luckily, by using the tax protein as a bait, okay, and by demonstrating that in fact, in tax expressing cells, that this spindle assembly checkpoint what was in fact effective, we were able to clone out at that time now, 10 years ago, published in the cell paper, the major component of the human spindle assembly checkpoint protein called MAD1, okay? So the reason it's called MAD1 is not because the protein is crazy, but because the acronym stands for mitotic arrest deficiency protein 1. Meaning that if you don't have this protein and you have the development of aneuploidy, okay, then the normal mitotic arrest that would otherwise happen becomes deficient, okay? So therefore the phenotype of a loss of this protein function would be a mitotic arrest deficiency phenotype even in the face of the development of aneuploidy, okay? So therefore, I think it was, it was quite uh, contributory to the understanding at that time to find this protein and then to be able to find all the other cofactors, which we didn't do, but other people in the field did, okay? To, to in fact identify a series of about a dozen proteins that participate, of which MAD1 and its cofactor, MAD2, are very important players in the game, okay? So after we did this uh, experiment and after we published the paper, and we were, we were, we were pretty happy because it, it really uh, contributed a new insight into, into a, a, at that time, an evolving field. Then we received a lot of criticism, okay? And the criticism we received was that all of our analysis was based on overexpression of an oncogenic protein. Okay? And there was indeed not fully convincing evidence that endogenously loss of this protein function has anything to do with the development of cancer. Okay? So you overexpress the oncoprotein, this protein doesn't work. Okay? But perhaps many other things are not working either. Okay? So how could you really say it is because of loss of this checkpoint and it is this loss of this particular protein that is really causal? the development of cancer. So we took that criticism to heart, okay? And three years ago, we decided that what we were going to have to do is to move to animal models, okay? And to demonstrate that in fact, if you generate endogenous loss of this protein by a gene-specific targeted knockout of the MAD1 allele in mouse cells, okay? That you could in fact demonstrate 
that these mice would be more tumor prone, right? So this is a direct proof, right? The checkpoint is important, okay? Lose the checkpoint or weaken the checkpoint, okay? And if it's important for development cancer, since you're only making one single uh, point knockout, okay, you should predict that the mice should develop more tumors, okay? Now the problem with this analysis is that the MAD1 protein, being a large protein, okay, um, and being important pro an important protein, is like almost all important proteins in the reality, which is that when you do successfully make, out the, make the knockout, okay, you are almost never able to make the homozygous knockout because the homozygosity in terms of knockout of most important proteins invariably leads to the heartbreaking phenotype of embryonically lethal. Okay? So the postdoc was all excited uh, and uh, to develop, a, he developed the, the knockout and he was able to demonstrate that you had germline transmission and you could get the heterozygous animals. Okay? And then he bred and he bred and he bred. Okay? And then he looked at a thousand offsprings and never once did he see a homozygous knockout. And so he became very depressed. And I want to tell you, there's nothing worse in a lab than a very depressed postdoc, okay? <laughs> right. so, so I said to myself, I said, okay, I have to work very hard, okay, to come up with a solution for him, okay? Because he was becoming like some of our mice. He was becoming moribund, okay? And that's a very, very bad phenotype, okay? So I said, so I said to him, I said, look, if this is a very important checkpoint, okay, let's think about cops and robbers, okay? Let's think about police and criminals, okay? So a checkpoint is like the police, you know, catching the criminals, okay, to make sure the bad guys, okay, don't run around, okay? So let's suppose we have a hundred police, okay, catching criminals, okay? So obviously the crime rate would be low, okay? Just like if we say the crime rate is equivalent to tumors. Now, Suppose we only have half of the police lost. Of course, if we knocked out all the police, killed all 100 policemen, the crime rate should go up quite dramatically. But on the other hand, if we knocked out 50% of the policemen, killed 50% of the policemen, the phenotype should still be clear. Because if it is indeed a very strong sensor against tumors, okay, even a heterozygous mouse should show tumor development. Okay? Because the dogma out there was always breed to homozygosity and then look for phenotype. Okay? There's no reason why we should necessarily okay, keep just that mantra. Okay? So I said, look, let's breed and characterize a lot of the heterozygous animals. Okay? And if it's really important as a checkpoint against tumors, okay, even the heterozygous knockout animals should get a big league increase in tumor. Okay? And indeed, that analysis turned out to be correct. Okay? So when we bred to about 129, you know, uh, or 120 or so uh, in, this, in this paired, uh, well-controlled cohort, what we find is that indeed you have a doubling of the tumors, okay, in wild type versus the heterozygous, okay. But even heterozygous, okay, and with a very robust p-value. So suggesting that this indeed is a very important century, okay, because just weakening the century, okay, weakening the sensor, Weakening is checkpoint, okay? Not complete abrogation of checkpoint is sufficient to manifest in a very large differential effect on tumor, tumor development, okay? And we were able to, in fact, do the experiment in a little greater sophistication because as I said to you, okay, there are actually several cofactors, okay? So, so MAD1 actually has a protein partner called MAD2. So MAD1 and MAD2 actually work well, okay? The optimal configuration is a heterodimer between MAD1 and MAD2. So MAD2, again, resists the knockout to homozygosity. But we could, in fact, make wild type, or we can make uh, you know, single heterozygous, single heterozygous, or double heterozygous. And we could see, in fact, the development of aneuploidy, propensity for aneuploidy, increases with the double heterozygous and the single heterozygous. And in fact, when we do the mouse experiments, what we can show is that the double heterozygous 
correlating with the propensity to develop aneuploidy actually gives greater propensity for tumor development. So we think that is a pretty nice proof for the fact that if you generate aneuploidy, it is causation. And the extent, the proclivity to develop aneuploidy correlates with the proclivity to develop tumors in the mouse system. Okay, so now some of you who are clinicians, perhaps some of you are clinicians, okay, Morrow was a clinician at one point, would say to me, well, but you know, in real life, okay, checkpoints don't exist in singularity, right? And you already talked about two checkpoints. So what happens if I have a patient that comes in and has lost a spindle assembly checkpoint? And of course, because this correlates um, you know, with 80% of cancers and this correlates with 50% of cancers, so there could be a lot of situations where I could have a patient that actually have both checkpoints lost, right? So what happens when patients come in with just P53 checkpoint loss? Or what happens when people, patients come in with spindle assembly checkpoint loss? What happens when you have double checkpoint loss, okay? I think this is a, perhaps not such a fantastic academic question because you could predict, you know, the genetic damage, okay, would be probably more severe when you have lost two checkpoints. But I think it's still a practical question that deserves an experimental verification. And since we have the mice available, we could, of course, breed P53 knockouts, okay, two simple assembly checkouts, knockouts, and get the compound genotype, okay, and ask the question, what happens to those mice with compound genotypes, okay? And in fact, that's what we did. Two completely distinct mechanisms, okay? One is censoring for structural damage, and one is censoring for, in fact, numerical damage, okay? If you marry them together, okay, what is the net outcome, okay? The net outcome turns out, okay, by doing these type of, uh, you know, uh, fish experiments to, to monitor for, for duplications or loss of chromosome copies, is that when you have, say, for example, heterozygous knockouts for a Smithle assembly checkpoint component and a P53 component, what you get is a much more significant deve development of the presentation of aneuploidy, okay? Surprisingly, because P53 was always thought to be fairly, fairly well circumscribed in terms of its DNA damage uh, checkpoint function, structural DNA damage. But if you lose P53, you actually tend to accelerate the, the loss of the, uh, the spindle assembly checkpoint uh, function also to aggravate that. Now, what would be a practical consequence of this? Okay? Practical consequence of this is when you look at these mice, okay, what you find is that in the P53 heterozygous mice, about 60% of them develop tumors. Okay? And their tumors are almost always of one single primary. Okay? What you find in the compound mice is actually the development of tumors that comes with greater frequency and the greater frequency, the greater number of tumors actually end up with many mice having multiple primaries. Okay? So in fact, we know in clinical settings, okay, there are some sets of unfortunate patients. Okay? So it's not uncommon to see patients, if we have a colon cancer, that they can have a lung metastasis. Okay? All right? That is very routine. Okay? But there are subsets of patients that in fact what you see is you see a primary colon and you also see a primary breast. Or you see a primary thyroid and you also see a primary lung, okay? And I would argue that in that situation, in fact, what is happening is mechanistically quite different, okay? So you lose one checkpoint, you develop one primary, and that primary can metastasize, and it looks like you're having multiple tumors. But you lose multiple checkpoints, what you end up doing is that you develop multiple primaries, okay? And in fact, in these mice, what we find is that the kinds of tumors that develop when you have compound genotypic loss of different checkpoint is that you get different tissue types of tumors. So for example, P53 uh, heterozygous mice are very common for developing lymphomas. On the other hand, rhabdomyosarcomas, adenocarcinomas, and mammary adenocarcinomas, lung or mammary, 
are very, very rare, almost non-existent. But in fact, when you superimpose a different kind of checkpoint on top of that, then you get these new tissue types of tumors being developed. So we would argue that the implication is that when you see individuals who come in with multiple primaries of tumors, okay, the treatment in terms of the chemotherapy that you would use has to be different because the drugs like Taxol, which relies on intact spindle assembly checkpoint to kill cells, would in fact probably be useless because the spindle assembly checkpoint is lost in those kind of patients, okay? So I think this is sort of interesting. And again, I think it's not a huge academic insight, but I think in terms of practical matters, uh, in terms of understanding human tumors and mammalian tumors and why different kinds of tumors develop and why you have multiple primaries as opposed to one single primary in metastasis, I think you know, these type of concerns are in fact uh, uh, insightful and, and help us shed some light. Now you know, of course, that as cancer biology has evolved over time, okay, we used to think cancer biology is all determined by genetics. Okay? So, so you have DNA damage, and the damaged cell develops into a cancer cell, and that's it. So, so for many years, the mantra about cancer was cancer is a disease of genetics. Okay? Then several years ago, okay, in fact, the example of the Helicobacter pylori okay, developing into stomach cancer, okay, that strict correlation really threw that mantra up on its head, okay? arguing that, in fact, the environmental inflammation has a very significant contribution to the pathogenesis of cancer. Okay? So it's not just purely genetics, okay? but it is genetically damaged cell in the context of a highly inflammatory environment okay, that actually worsens the prognosis and, and ensures better survival of the cancer cells and therefore the cancer to take hold. So that led us to, the, to another related field, okay, which is to understand when HTLV-1 infects you, okay, does it or does it not cause inflammatory changes? And it does, we know that from natural history. And if it does, what is the inciting element in the virus and how do we understand the mechanism of how it causes inflammation? Okay? So we wrestled with this topic for quite some time. Okay, and it turns out that the major inciting inflammatory element in the virus also turns out to be the transforming element of the virus, which turns out to be the tax protein. Okay? So this is really a very dramatic illustration of the highly inflammatory changes that you get. And this is, this is not our experiment. Okay? This was actually published by our colleague, Warner Green. But it was such a beautiful experiment, and I actually edited this paper, so, so I, I, I felt that I have some credit for bringing this paper into the literature. So, 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 so I, I, I want I wanted to just you know, bring it to, to your attention. In this particular mice, all the mouse expresses is a tetracycline-inducible tax protein. Okay? So what happens is that if you feed put tetracycline into the water that you feed the mouse, all of a sudden you get this exfoliating dermatitis, which is a big league inflammatory change. Okay? And if you withdraw the tetracycline out, so you shut down the expression of tax protein, you get the mouse recover back to its normalcy. Okay? Inflammation is gone. Okay? So it tells us then that the virus comes in, okay? the virus uses tax protein to transform cells, and the tax protein is also used to create inflammation. Okay? Now, inflammation is a really very hard topic to investigate. Okay? And it is really in the purview of the immunologists. Okay? And of course, you know, the immunologists, they're very smart people, and they think virologists are completely ignorant about immunology. And it's true. Okay? we always envy the immunologists because they use such sophisticated terms and names and they, they have all sorts of cell types and things that we don't understand, okay? So, so secretly I always want to be an immunologist, right? And, but from a molecular biologist's point of view and from a virologist's point of view, you can really become a pseudo-expert in understanding inflammation as long as you understand 
how one particular protein is regulated. Okay? Because even the immunologists would agree with me when I say, in terms of inflammation, all roads lead to NF-kappa B. Okay? Not very immunologists are going to jump up and disagree. Okay? Because when you trace back to all sorts of cytokine signaling, all sorts of inflammatory signaling, it always comes down to how is NF-kappa B regulated. There's always a central player. Okay? And we were very fortunate in that we, many years ago, contributed to the understanding of the activation pathway of NF-kappa B through the IKK gamma or the NEMO protein. And actually, we were the first group to report the identification of the NEMO protein on the X chromosome. Right? And that is the reason why males are more susceptible to many autoimmune inflammatory diseases than females, because it's an excellent defect. Okay? And IKK uh, I gamma, of course, as many of you know, is really an important component. Okay? It's also called the NEMO protein okay? for activation through the canonical pathway. Okay? But what we always wanted, in addition to understanding how activation of NF-kappa B works, we also wanted to understand how repression of NF-kappa B works. Okay? Because that's much harder to do. I mean, everybody and his cousin can activate NF-kappa B. You put on some TNF-alpha, you put on some LPS, boom, NF-kappa B is activated. Now, once it's activated, how do you repress it? Okay? I bet you don't know. I bet, you know, if I were to pose that question, you know, not many people will get an A on that particular question. Okay? So we actually found a tax binding protein that turns out to be a repressor of NF kappa B. Okay? So how does this protein work? Well, so that was like a $64 million question. Okay? And you could do in vitro experiments, you could do overexpression experiments, and so on and so forth. And we learned from our experience with the MAD1 protein that you do all those experiments, okay, and your colleagues are going to club you over the head okay, with a baseball bat and say, non-physiological. Non-physiological, what does the endogenous protein do? What is the mechanism? Okay? So we said, okay, let's avoid all the overexpression grief, and let's just go straight to the knockout. Okay? So we made the knockout mouse, and here we were very fortunate okay, that we can, in fact, knock it out to, heterozy uh, to homozygosity. Okay? But the bad part of knocking out things to homozygosity and being able to get a protein that's not embryonically lethal is that you get a normal birth. So what is the definition of a normal birth? The definition of a normal birth is that no phenotype or very mild phenotype. Right? So on the one hand, the postdoc got very excited because the other postdoc could not breed to homozygosity. And this guy got his system to breed to homozygosity. On the other hand, the reason the other guy couldn't breed to homozygosity was because the protein was very important, had a big function. And this guy now, very happy with lots of mice running around, but he says, well, what's the phenotype? Okay. So it turns out that he looks at it long enough and he says, oh, you know, there's a significant number of the homozygous knockouts that in fact die, they die earlier. Okay. Okay. Early deaths, okay, it's clearly pathological. Okay. But what's the reason for early death? Turns out the reason for early death is very interesting. Okay. The reason for early death is in fact all the dead animals had cardiac valvulitis. So they were all born with normal heart valves. Okay? But over time, they had hyperinflammatory changes to the heart valves, and they all died from cardiac failure. Okay? And the reason they all died from cardiac failure turns out to be that all of the NF-kappa B signaling okay, in cells that are knocked out for this particular protein okay, are hyperactivated. Okay? So whether you use TNF-alpha, LPS, or IL-1 beta, what you find is that the mouse embryo fibroblasts that are homozygously lost for this particular protein always activated NF-kappa B much, much more robustly than the wild-type protein. Okay? What's the mechanism? The mechanism turns out to be very informative. Okay? Turns out that this particular protein is critical to bring a D-ubiquitinase to the NF-kappa B signaling protein called TRAF6. Okay? So in TRAF6, activation of TRAF6 and signaling to NF-kappa B okay, is due to polyubiquitination. Okay? This is K63 polyubiquitination, not a K48, which, which leads to degradation. Okay? 
So once you activate a signaling molecule by polyubiquitination, okay, then of course the deactivation is a deubiquitinase to come and chop the ubiquitin molecules off. Okay. But for this deubiquitinase A20 to come and chop this off, it actually needs a ferry. Okay. So this adapter protein binds to A20, ferries it to TRAF6, chops the ubiquitin off, silences the signal, so it acts as a repressor protein. Okay? So it's a repressor complex. If you knock it out, the deubiquitinase can never come. So anytime you have IL-1 or LPS or signaling through this, it becomes all hyperactivated. Okay? So of course the mice over time are exposed to ambient, you know, these type of signaling molecules, and therefore they develop hyperinflammation. And one of the manifestations of hyperinflammation are these cardiac dysfunctions. Okay? So I think this was also an interesting story because it helped, I think, open the field, which now is now uh, sort of uh, going on. So we published this in 2008. So, so now you're seeing increasing number of papers coming out on the role, not of the ligase, not of the ubiquitin ligase, but of the ubiquitin deubiquitinase in terms of their regulatory impl implications for many mechanisms and many diseases. Okay, so we were sort of happy with this chapter of studying cancer, okay, via the inflama inflammation angle. So finally then, that, let me just close by thanking the, uh, and uh, acknowledging the postdoctoral fellows. In particular, this was a very energetic uh, uh, female postdoc that uh, did all the uh, Sun One experiments. Thank you very much. <laughs>